the ocean are the ones who helped to coordinate this review process. And I'm give a very brief intro to what's going on, uh, to what we'll be doing today. One moment. Or microphones to make it uh, hopefully sound a little better. And go through a few logistical points. First of all, we're going to be recording this webinar, so uh, the presentation will be available on the website afterwards. Uh, and I hope everyone is is eventually able to log into the WebEx. We apologize for the details, uh, the problems we've been having. You'll see down at the bottom in these, these initial introductory slides that we are going to have a public comment period at the end of this, and to make that work with the WebEx, the best thing to do will, is to either use the chat function within WebEx or to send an email to the email address abalone at calost, that's C-A-L-O-S-T dot O-R-G. And we will keep a queue of people who have, have expressed interest in presenting, and at the end of the presentation we will have time for those. First of all, I'd like to introduce our scientific advisory committee. Uh, images are up here. We have Dr. Mark Carr, Dr. Jeremy Prince, Dr. Brian Tissot, Dr. Pete Ramundi, Dr. Karina Nilsson, and Dr. Steve Schroeder. And these six individuals were selected <laughs> through a nomination process that included nominations from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, from various of you constituent groups who, who are on here. All of them had to have a minimum set of qualifications, including a PhD in marine science relevant experience to research on abalone. And we really want to just start off by expressing our, our deepest appreciation for all of the work that went into this. This was, uh, in addition to the pieces of the this process that you have seen, this involved many, many hours of emails, of phone calls, of, of crunch data in their own time. So this is a lot of work, and we, and we greatly appreciate the efforts that the individuals have put into this. I'd like to introduce the process very briefly. I, I know that most of you heard this during our initial webinar. The initial impetus for this process came for a request from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, and we really want to express our appreciation to them as partners throughout this process. Over and over again, we heard from the department that they really want to make sure that they are getting everything right. They really want to make sure that they're doing the best thing for the resource. And, and doing so in the in the use the best science, and we greatly appreciate working with them. Our organization is the California Ocean Science Trust. We've been tasked as the independent organization to facilitate this review process. We design the process, and we have maintained the, the integrity of the process throughout. I think it has included acting as go-betweens between the department and the SAC, and again. And all of this is done to make sure that this is the, the most fair and independent review we can manage. We'd also like to acknowledge the Ocean Protection Council who provided the funding for the process. And I to go through the scope of this review, I've done this on, on our previous calls as well, and want to just point out what this review was and, and uh, by location what it was not. The review was to... to the scientific and technical merit of the survey design, including strengths and weaknesses of current methods for estimating red abalone density. This was also to look at the application of existing methods, including analysis of existing data, interpretation of results. And finally, the uncertainty associated with existing methods for estimating red abalone density in Northern California and its adequacy for informing catch limits and other management controls of the recreational red abalone fishery in Northern California as outlined by the Abalone Recovery Management Plan. This was what the SAC was tasked with doing, and we've seen that very seriously throughout the process of recognizing when discussions were going outside of the scope. And so it, it, that is, is really what shapes the report that this will produce. This process has been has been quite a long one. We uh, had our initial public our kicking off the process back in September. There was a, a technical workshop. Uh, then there were several months of, of getting data and crunching through the data to really evaluate those portions of the scope. 
And then over the last several months, there's been the, the developing the recommendations, developing the report. We presented it at the Marine Resources Committee back in March, and we're now in the process of, of finalizing what this report is going to look like, and that is the, where we are here with this process, is to, for the SAC to present to you what the report is going to look like. Now, I'll emphasize that this report is not yet finalized. We're hoping to deliver the final report by, by early June, um, but at this point, we really know what the shape of that is going to be, and so it's an appropriate time for this presentation. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mark Carr uh, as the chair of the, of the Scientific Advisory Committee. He is going to present the major findings of this of this process, um, and I expect that this will, will be about a half hour of presentation, and then following that we'll have the public comment period. So again, throughout the process, if you want to make public comments, please send an email or use the chat function, and we'll take that at the end. All right. So before I start, because anybody who knows me is well aware that I'm likely to forget uh, by the time I'm, I'm done with my comments, uh, to express on behalf of myself and the entire SAC um, of the, our appreciation for all the work that you, Dr. O'Donnell, a.k.a. Moose, um, as well as Emily Knight, Haley Carter, Eve Robinson, Aaron Ramanjam, um, the work that the five of you did to both uh, facilitate the meetings that we've had over the last couple of years, as well as contribute importantly to this 36-page report that was generated by, by the Science Advisory Committee, as well as the staff. And so, as, as you did, Moose, I want to thank, thank colleagues uh, on the Science Advisory Committee for all the thought and all these analyses that they've contributed to. Uh, and for the group's overall recommendations. So what I want to do very quickly is to review the highlights of the report. So we have ample time to feed as many questions as possible. Go ahead, next slide. Thanks. Um, and I want to start by quickly reviewing the previous webinar and, and some of the meetings we've had with Fish and Wildlife. Um, for those of you who may not have participated in that previous webinar, so during those meetings, uh, the department summarized and presented for us their sampling design, their sampling protocols or methods, analyses that they've conducted. And in particular, those analyses focused on the time series of changes in abalone densities uh, within the index sites that they surveyed. And importantly, the statistical power of those analyses based on those sampling designs to detect the changes in abalone density over time. Um, provided us with an extensive written report, uh, included data that we use to conduct our own analyses. Um, and that report, again, included a, a, an even more thorough description of the design and the protocol and the analyses. Um, they've conducted uh, for, for this process. Next. Um, and, and I want to start with uh, with um, sort of summarizing the spatial and temporal sampling design that was presented by the department because critical background information for understanding not only how the abalone densities are generated, but also um, for the understanding the analyses um, and, and the recommendations that the Science Advisory Committee has, has generated. Um, so that's uh, uh, the sampling design, remember, involves scuba surveys that are conducted in each of what are referred to as eight index sites that you can see are distributed um, e equally between the Sonoma County area and the Mendocino County. Um, and within each of those eight index sites, they've ratified their sampling across four different depth zones. They place nine of these transects that they survey abalone densities on within each of those depth zones. So they have uh, 36 transects that they survey at each of these index sites when they visit a site. 
Um, and they use GPS coordinates that they generate prior to going out in the field to randomly distribute those transects across each of the eight index sites with the hope of representatively sampling each of those areas. And the correction that they'll do is uh, if they start a transect and they encounter 50% or more of, of one suitable soft bottom or sand habitat, that's when they'll redirect a transect back onto more suitable abalone habitat. One of the key things uh, with this, with their temporal sampling, is that it takes about three years to complete a survey cycle, which means that that at, at highest frequency they, they revisit a given site only every three years, and this is an issue that that we'll talk about later. Next, um, and then they describe the analyses that they've conducted and. Uh, um, and I want to draw your attention to this graphic that they presented on the right uh, that shows changes in abalone density. And abalone density is indicated on the vertical axis. In this case, it's density per meter square. Um, for each of two of these consecutive time periods that they've sampled those eight index sites, so plotted there is the mean uh, density during 2003 to seven sampling cycle, and then the mean density later in the consecutive 09 to 12 sampling cycle. Uh, and and uh, I want to point out that it, you see that it takes about four to five years to get through those eight index sites, and then a couple of years between those uh, cycles, those surveys, to actually generate the data to compare and estimate any changes in abalone density. So quite a quite a delay in um, in sampling uh, uh, individual sites through time that we'll talk about as well. They conduct power analyses, which are tests of the the, um, the the ability or the power of a statistical analysis to detect these changes that they're trying to detect over time. And um, in, and specifically, they were doing a power analysis to detect the ability, or excuse me, to, to determine their ability to detect a 25% decline in abalone densities to one of these management triggers in abalone density. Um, and, and I want to point out that, that, that for both the ANOVA to detect change um, and the power analyses, the department used individual transects as the unit of replication. And I mention this because um, that's an issue of concern that we'll talk, we'll visit later in the presentation. And I want to point out that that, that they conduct these analyses um, at three different spatial scales: changes in abalone density across all eight index sites over time, or each of the two counties over time, or any one individual site index site over time as well. Next, please. The purpose of these density estimates that they generate from these surveys is to pair those densities with uh, referred to as either uh, density uh, management triggers or management thresholds. Um, they're defined in the Abalone Recovery Management Plan, the ARMP. I want to draw your attention, for example, to this column on the far right of this table. Uh, which are the uh, actual management actions that are determined by these densities. So you can see the first row is an increase in the total allowable catch. Uh, uh, the second row is maintaining the, the current total allowable catch. Third row is reducing the catch. Fourth is actually closing the fishery altogether. And the fifth bottom row is if a site, if a, if the fish has been closed or an area has been closed, uh, they be required to reopen a uh, closed area. Uh, and uh, now I want to draw your attention to these middle columns that are the actual density uh, triggers or threshold values. And the, notice that these densities are abalone per hectare. And there's two columns. There are 
dense is based on uh, the deeper two depth zones, which are referred to as the refuge depths below 30 feet. And you can see that there's different values for those two depth zones relative to the column further to the right. Which includes um, transects across all depth zones. So, for example, uh, at middle row, uh, where we're talking about the potential of reducing the tack by 25%, conducted if there was a density estimate that was 2,500 abalone per hectare less um, than the than the prior um, the, the existing or the target survey. And then likewise, um, five, a, a reduction of 5,000 abalone per hectare less um, across all depths. You see that the key uh, to, uh, to the occasion of these density estimates to inform these management decisions is how those density estimates relate to each of these density thresholds density triggers that are laid out in the in the RMP. Now, so, so therefore these analyses that compare density estimated from the field with the threshold or trigger densities is really the crux of the analyses of data. Um, and importantly you don't recognize that the the management plan does not specify anything more than a comparison of two numbers, the estimated density versus the threshold density that was defined in that previous table. And the problem with this is that just comparing an average density to a management trigger ignores the reality that there's variability in your estimate of that mean density from the field. Um, so you can, and you can't ignore that variability that's associated with the estimates. And that variability, importantly, conveys the level of certainty or confidence that one has in the estimate in the field that you're comparing with those threshold densities. So it's the Science Advisory Committee's opinion that this cumulative probability functions, or CPFs, are one of the most appropriate analyses to be used to interpret these density estimates relative to a given threshold. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing that because it's one that we strongly recommend that the department um, start to use uh, to form these management decisions. Secondly, um, is the application of, of uh, analysis of variance of the time series that is particularly useful for characterizing the trend of the abalone populations um, within the index sites um, over time. About the important application of those the time series later. But it's important to recognize that these analyses require certain assumptions of the data, the distribution, whether it's normally distributed or when you're comparing. Uh, different means over time, the, the comparability of the variances between the samples. That we looked at the data generated by the department uh, did not meet uh, those, uh, those assumptions when using transects as the unit of replication. Uh, we found that using sites as replicates, uh, after what we used in the, in the analyses that the, the committee um, performed, actually met the assumptions, the par these parametric analyses that we're recommending. Now, I said that, even the examples that I'm going to present use sites as replicates, can in fact use transects as replicates if you um, use different approaches for those data sets. For example, resampling the data, you know, that uh, um, allows uh, or, or avoids any kind of uh, um, error or, or a bias in the data uh, that prior transformation. Okay, next. Uh, so, but one of the key issues that I want to emphasize before we move into our particular analyses is that the SAC gave a great bit of uh, thought to is the application of these 
index states to making what are, let's say, fishery-wide management actions. Um, and it's critical that, that those who are conducting these analyses and those receiving the analyses understand that the surveys conducted in these index sites does not give you information outside of those eight index sites, even though the management decisions pertain to the entire fishery or the entire region, right? And so, so it's important to recognize that, that the analyses pertain only to changes in abalone density within all eight or a subset of these index sites. If you wanted to make inferences about changes in abalone density beyond the eight index sites, for example, across the region or across a county, you'd assume that those sites are representative of entire regions that constitute the fishery. And it's clear that they are. They were not randomly chosen uh, to represent those entire the entire fishery. Rather, they represented areas that um, constituted a uh, large portion of the fishery. And, um, and if you do want to tr use these eight index sites to make inferences, you absolutely have to use sites as the unit of replication. You can't use the transects within those sites. And this is on, on how one approaches these analyses. Next slide, please. Um, so, so this is uh, one of the first um, analyses that the SAC recommends, referred to the cumulative probability function. And what I want, and I want to explain this CPF that's that we recommended for comparing the density estimates with a fi fishery trigger or a threshold density. I want to draw your attention to this graphic on the right, and uh, this this uh, graphic. This curve, this particular cumulative probability function, is defined uh, by two things. The position of the curve is centered on the fishery trigger. So see that vertical dashed line runs through the middle of the curve to 5,000 abalone per hectare because we're, we're comparing an estimate with that particular density trigger. Then, oh, wait a minute, you. Then the, uh, the shape of the curve <laughs> is, is defined essentially by the sampling design and the data that are generated from sampling design to estimate mean densities. Um, that can do is use those, those estimates from the field, which are indicated on the bottom uh, of the graph along the horizontal axis, as abalone densities are based on using, as I mentioned earlier, sites rather than transects as replicates, using the data that the department generated in 2009. So uh, next, um, here's an example where we um, we estimated an abalone density of something like uh, 1,750, and for that uh, that estimate. Um, you can use the curve to determine the probability that that the actual density based on that estimate lies below 5,000 individuals per hectare, which is our threshold. So in this case, for example, an estimate of about 3,700 abalone, we have a roughly 95% confidence that that estimate will be below that threshold density of 5,000. Now, as yet estimates that are closer to that threshold, because variability in the data, you should get lower confidence um, in, in the likelihood that that estimate lies below that threshold. So now, for example, at around uh, 4,500 abalone per hour, we have about an 80% confidence that uh, the that our actual estimate lies below that 5,000 threshold. And then uh, next, uh, conversely, if we estimated a density as high as 5,500 individuals, then have is a, a, only a 20% um, 
likelihood the the actual estimate or the actual the density lies below that five thousand um, density threshold. So one thing to notice here is that there are three different curves. Uh, the three different curves are based on increasing numbers of, of uh, sites that we use in the analysis. And what we've used so far are uh, based on eight index sites. But you'll notice that the, the curve gets steeper as you increase the number of replicate sites so that for a given density estimate, you have a higher confidence in where that mean value, where that actual value lies relative to the trigger. So it's nice because it allows you to build these curves for different numbers of samples and show how changes in sample size enhance your comp enhance or decrease your confidence in your estimate relative to those threshold values. Um, and importantly, these curves can be generated, again, for all index sites, for the four index sites in each county, or for a given uh, index, an individual index site. And it's about the generation of these curves is they, they're really explicit about the likelihood that an actual index population is above or below that threshold. And so it makes very transparent degree of certainty or uncertainty that, that we have in, in our estimates. Um, of, our, of, of where the, the population lies relative to these thresholds. Next, please. The recommended analysis is akin to what the department presented, uh, applying the change in abalone density over time. Um, and, and, a, and the key a aspect of these analyses is that it allows you to identify temporal trends or trajectories of the populations. Um, I want to draw your attention to the graphic to the right, for example, uh, and, and specifically to uh, mean and the 95% confidence uh, estimates or intervals around that mean for the first period, that graph to the right. And see that that mean lies just above the green, uh, green threshold densities. But anyway, we don't know where that mean actually lies within that 95% confidence interval. So we don't know whether that mean is actually above that green threshold value, below that green threshold value, or actually closer down to the next lower pink, uh, pink line, which is the next lowest threshold value. And so it's, it's less certain as to where the value lies relative to a threshold value, which is why we endorse the, uh, the use of those cumulative probability functions. It does allow you to track the change in, in the density of the population through time. And, and that's very useful for several reasons, uh, which we'll describe later, but, but more importantly for for being able to forecast what the state of the population is likely to be in the future. Well, for just a second, and and one of the key things um, uh, of values of, of using these changes through time, the frequency of what uh, uh, at which they're generated. So, so clearly, the more frequent you go out and estimate these mean values, for example, every year or every other year or every third year is going to dictate how quickly you can see a change in abalone density and respond to it in a manage, with a management decision. And again, this is key. This, this reinforces the importance of the frequency of surveys. Um, next slide, please. So I want to summarize then uh, some of the key recommendations with respect to analyses. The first is to generate these cumulative probability functions for these threshold assessments. Make very clear uh, our confidence in, the, in a density estimate relative to, to a management threshold. And importantly, it requires managers to specify an acceptable level of risk or certainty with a decision. Because that level of risk associated with the estimate is, is identified in that cumulative probability function. So it, it requires the decision makers 
to to recognize what their risk is, what their level of certainty is when they make a decision. And that level of certainty is clear to everyone who looks at those figures. This is the time series with their confidence intervals that are key for characterizing trends in the sites. That again allows you to forecast the direct and future state of an index population so that so that decisions can be made more proactively. With environmental information, like climate conditions, like El Nino, La Nina, sea surface temperatures, and habitat information, like changes in the amount of kelp along the coast, you can help explain the state of an index population why, and why it's changing through time. What are the key environmental drivers that may be explaining those changes? And that's important, again, for helping to decouple whether changes in populations are, are related to catch rates or to these other environmental drivers. But as I mentioned, it, it's, uh, the more frequent that these samples can be conducted at a given site, the more quickly uh, uh, managers can respond to these changes. Next slide. So, so I want to quickly run through uh, some of the key recommendations that, that uh, were made by the, the Science Advisory Committee. Um, the first is a subset that are based on using the existing density method. Um, and uh, again, one of the key things that we, we are in recommending is that, that you uh, increase the frequency at which these surveys are conducted at a given site so you can track more quickly um, these changes in, and respond more quickly to these changes in the, in the source. Another thing is that the, uh, the department goes to some pretty extensive effort to collect habitat data when they're doing these abalone density surveys. Uh, they record, for example, the, some of the, the amount of algae, uh, the amount of kelp that's in area, some of the other key organisms that are in the communities that the abalones are in. And that information, though it won't enhance the precision of the analyses, uh, is important, again, for explaining and forecasting why you see changes in the abalone population. So, so we endorse the idea that, you continue to collect, that they continue to collect that data, um, but use those habitat data and explore those data to better understand what's driving some of the changes uh, from one site to the next in the populations. The other recommendation is to codify these, these analyses that like the cumulative probability functions in abalone recovery management plan uh, so that those are, are required analyses uh, to inform the vision making. Thus to revisit some, some of the sustainable fish, some the, is it the, excuse me, the, um, the densities uh, that were used uh, and determined to, to, to characterize uh, the sustainable sustainability of the fishery. Uh, and I, the reason we say that is because those initial target densities that are considered uh, the sustainable fishery densities were um, based on only a subset, I think about three of those index sites at the time that the management plan was developed. And after that, they had density estimate, they generated density estimates across all eight in index sites. And it's actually a greater data set that could be used uh, if, if uh, it thought necessary to revisit and, uh, and redefine what those sustainable fish density levels might be. Um, the other is to modify the, the current density surveys, if possible, to be uh, more powerful and, and efficient. For example, um, if the deepest transects that are surveyed uh, generate very few, they're, they're generate very few numbers, um, the very few abalone that occur in that deepest depth, and yet it's a good bit of effort to survey those deep, deep transects that don't inform the density estimates very much. So one possibility is to negate those, those deep transects and relocate those transects in all lower areas of the population to increase the, the precision of the estimates of 
density. Another might be to weight sampling habitat suitability. Um, so to use data on um, the habitat features within these index sites and, and especially to the extent possible to explore the role of the um, seafloor maps that were generated along that part of the coast. Um, it's not clear how far inshore they go, but certainly they, I know they cover uh, depth range of some of these index sites and and you use those um, and to characterize the habitat and suitability of the habitat and then perhaps either weight the, the density estimates that are generated across that variation in habitat or allocate transects across those habit that variation in habitat. So those are things that I think that we felt um, would be worth exploring further in the development and redesign of, um, of surveys. Moving on the density metrics, um, it would be good to transition to tracking the condition of the population. So as many of you know, uh, characterizing the size and age distribution of, uh, of individuals in a population, including recruitment, as well as how many individuals are sexually mature within a population is extremely useful for characterizing the, the health, if you will, or the condition um, of that population. And this is something that would be good to, uh, to see the department start to use more of the size data that they generate. Um, the other is exploring alternatively scientifically-based manage management reference points, for example, spawning potential ratio and other metrics that are used in other, uh, manage other fisheries. Um, as uh, uh, various metrics of stock assessments. And then finally, uh, overarching recommendations that we had uh, was, uh, you know, based on um, we thought was, uh, was a pretty successful interaction to be by others, of course, with the department, um, would be to recommend a general collaboration between the department and external scientific experts. And and those of you who are familiar with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, you know that they have a statistical committee, a statistical committee that reviews the analyses generated by the National Marine Fisheries Service biologists. Um, as such, they bring in external expertise to, to um, review and provide insight into the analyses that are being conducted by the fisheries biologists. Something akin to that model, we think would be really nice for the department to adopt as well. Um, and finally, uh, you know, because these data are of interest not just to managers, but to users and the scientific community uh, who are interested in contributing to this, to the sound management of the fishery, it'd be nice that these data were made publicly available in a timely manner. And what I mean by a timely manner is you don't just uh, make them available as quickly as they're generated because you got to make damn sure that they're QA, QC'd, and, and, and of quality to release to people. And, um, you know, given sufficient uh, analysis and, and quality control, the sooner the data can be made available um, to others, the better. Uh, just the transparency of the management of the fish and, and how effective this management approach is. is. Uh, so next slide. Um, I, I want to close uh, before I turn it back over to you, Ms. Um, with Lane Karina or Steve or Pete uh, pop in with any comments to uh, add to any of my comments or correct thing that I may have uh, misconstrued. The comment? I, I, job. Yeah. I, I think there's a time because, you know, we've only got 15 more minutes. We'll just wait and see if there's questions that require us to, to, to require me at least to talk. Yeah, right. If you guys can help uh, ask questions, that would be excellent. Thanks. Good. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate that. And now we're going to move on to the public comment period. And I'll emphasize that this is, is 
described as a public comment period, and obviously there's room for some back and forth to answer clarifying questions. So we can't guarantee that the SAC will be available, will be able to answer any question you might ask. There's certainly room to send follow-up questions, um, that, and we'll see if those are, are able, the questions are able to be answered within the final report. Uh, obviously, any any clarifying question about something Mark said, we'll do a to answer throughout this. So any comment will be capped at a maximum of three minutes. We have uh, two people who have submitted, uh, let know that they want to make comments. Bill Bernard is the first on the list. And because of the vagaries of WebEx, we have to figure out which line to unmute. So we're going to unmute several lines at one. And then, Bill, if you can uh, just speak up, we will uh, eventually will be right. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Hey, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for all the work they've done, including the department asking to have this review. Moose Penoy, thank you for helping me out on some other issues. Dr. Carr, once again, it's a pleasure working with you on, on issues again. As to the SAC members, uh, Katrina, I worked with you in the MLPA process and some of you guys AG process. I had a question, though, for you. It's kind of um, um, what is, would your guys' short-term recommendation for management practices be now per se, and, and until the FMP process completes? You have a short-term mm -hmm. recommendation, you know. How, so, you know, this is a big difference. In what you're talking about here? Do you have a short-term recommendation until the Abalone FMP process completes for Red Abalone? I'll start by responding, Bill, and then and then the others can chime in too. Um, so, a short-term, you know, recommendation is that uh, these analyses, like these cumulative probability functions, uh, can you know, we just we did a couple of examples to demonstrate the value of that analysis, but but actually the department and others can start running these analyses um, sooner than later. They can do it next week, so to speak. And, and of course, there's a lot of variation in that. You can do it across eight index sites. You can, I suggested, you can do the kinds of um, statistical approaches allow you to use transect data um, uh, so they can explore the use of the transects, the sites, the, the across the index sites, at the county level, at the individual in index site, and, and really start exploring this uh, analytical approach now so that they're comfortable with it and, and, it, and have a better feel for uh, potentially incorporating it in, uh, subsequently into the uh, management plan. Okay, with that for right now. Um, and the next question is, I, w I want to thank you guys for recognizing what the fishery potential is. In other words, when you were stating that, you know, the index sites in no way really can represent anything beyond just the index sites. You know, for example, when we look at, you know, the index up in the very up north, like Todd's Point, you know, how can that can represent all the way up to the Oregon border and, and vice versa, you know, from Fort Ross all down to the gate, which we have, you know, like 70, 100, 130 miles of coastline. Um, that's important to recognize that fishery is just not where the 96% of the effort is taking place, but it's also there's other potential here that hasn't been utilized yet, and I think it's important to capture that. You know, yeah. Yeah. I have a quick response to that. One is that, well, that that's where some of these data that we've talked about that could be collected beyond the density estimates I think will be useful for causing larger scales of the fishery. Um, but there is, you know, there's this trade-off because uh, you, could, you could, given the limited amount of, of time and money that, that the department can throw at these surveys, the fundamental question is, do you distribute those up and down the whole region of fishery, or do you um, focus on these index sites instead? And again, you know, re revisiting that um, uh, would be useful as well. That's sort of a longer-term consideration uh, for the management plan. Yeah, I'd like to just make a comment here, uh, just to follow up. The other thing about representation or representativeness of the sites is that it's some way to guide the regional management. And 
you know, for borers, they're not going to be able to sample all sites. And so I think that there's really two things. One is in the, there's going to be a set of sites that are going to be used in order to manage it, in order to estimate what the, the levels are <clears throat> and to make recommendations or to make guidance, give guidance as to what will happen in the next period. And it also means that perhaps, as Mark was saying, stating earlier, there may be a way to efficiently, more efficiently sample the existing sites and add additional sites that would be more representative of the whole region that I'm talking about. Yeah, because that's important because between the bio regions from all the way from north to south, um, it, the entities are and they have different characteristics. You know, for example, the abalone that are basically uh, you know, like south of Four Rouse, Marin Headlands, and stuff like that, typically tend to be a little bit shallower, more dome and what you might see around Timber Cove or, you know, um, Sea Ring type of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the same thing with the Avalon up in the north of the area or, or north of Hardy Creek. Once again, for <coughs> those individuals to grow out and have certain type of populations based upon the breeds. And, and you guys are getting at that. And, that, and, that's, and that's, really, that's really good. I'm glad you're capturing that. Um, kind of things. I just, what one, one more thing could we add, currently add to our card that would uh, um, more fishery dependent data that could be used uh, mm -hmm. as, as a replicate as a rep, as the replicating a way of saying you know school sites per se. What you're drawing at there. I do, I do realize the economic limitations of X sites. You know, the more would be is great, but the economically being able to do that is. Very limiting. I uh, I believe so. One All right. Here. Uh, just to follow up. One of the things Mark alluded to earlier was they are collecting data on on not only you know adults or individuals that can be harvested, but also on individuals and their size structure. Australia, which has developed a much more sophisticated approach to managing abalone than we have here, she used a size structure in a very predictive way so that they can kind of. Uh, take based upon what the likely next generation is going to be there, and that's all based upon the size structure. And so there are, th those data are already being, collect being collected, and there might be a way to use those in the future. Thank you very much for the time, gentlemen. Uh, Beth, thanks. Did you hear from me? Welcome. Curry, do you have a comment you want to make as well? Uh, no, more the uh, well, I guess I might add one thing that needs to be considered about the way the uh, index size sites were selected, the spirit was meant to be, um, they were meant to serve as sort of canaries in the coal mine. Uh, well. So, you know, as part of embedding a precautionary approach into the management scheme, and um, as a result, they tend to be more sensitive to what's going on at those particular sites and also don't represent, but kind of by design. So, mm -hmm. so thinking about how how to uh, uh, think about those things going forward in a new uh, FMP is, is important, but, but acknowledging that's why they are the way that they are in some ways. Great. Thank you all. Our next our next commentary is Chris Voss. Yeah, this is Chris Voss. And I'd like to start by thanking all of you for all the um, excellent work that you've done. I really very, uh, very much appreciate it. Um, then i uh, just make a general comment about um, things that have been mentioned. The notion of precaution, um, you used to it uh, with respect to the way the ARMP uh, used density in the past. And I think we need to recognize it's a new world with MPAs in that area that give us an increased measure, measure of precaution as to what tax that we can have on the overall population. Because the MPA should be uh, considered in, in um, 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 kind of a calculation of, of, in fact, how many uh, abalones are on the north coast. And, and how well they can um, uh, reproduce. Uh, and in addition to that, the notion that uh, fisheries dependent information uh, could be used in the future, given that we are moving into an FMP process, um, the recommendations I think are exceeding valuable in informing uh, how we may, if we choose, uh, to pursue a, a much, much less uh, inexpe um, expensive uh, means to uh, track the size of the stock using, as, as already mentioned, the size, a size structure of the catch, which probably would be fisheries-dependent generates, 
but to also <laughs> capture uh, the size structure of the catch also that may be of value too um, in, 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 in the thumb. With the um, reporting system that we have, there are new um, data streams that can be made available to uh, man in form management that we should, uh, we should um, uh, contemplate as, as Bill suggested incorporating into, uh, into the um, decision making process um, moving ahead. So um, uh, as a commercial diver, I struggled with the way density was calculated uh, when we did extensive surveys at Cell Island. And so um, I'm thinking, because I've been directly involved in this effort to really mind around how you use density to make these decisions, it, it seems exceedingly costly to try to use the AMP as it is to e open a fishery like maybe greens in the in the Southern California Bight or reds at Sail Island or even adequately assess the North Coast Recreational Fishery. Um, and I think your analysis points out uh, that there's some serious weaknesses and that it's going to cost considerably more to reduce those weaknesses or to eliminate those, those weaknesses. And so. Uh, we, I think we got to really start thinking um, more progressively. If I can quick, you bet. Hey, thanks, Chris. And if I can quickly uh, give two responses to your comments. The first is going back to your comment about the incorporate, uh, incorporation of the network of reserves into the management plan. Um, and hang onto your britches because that's where uh, that's one of the key foci. Uh, I think the department and the academic community and the National Marine Fisheries Service as well are all looking to uh, restart thinking about how we're going to apply these reserves into these management plans and, and a stock assessment. So, so touched uh, uh, on an issue that is really big right now um, and receiving a lot of attention and, and is exciting as well. The other that you touched on is something close to home as well because when we're doing these surveys to try to monitor the reserve system, um, we're with this very same issue that you brought up at the end of your comments, which is, if we're going to do this, how are we going to do it cost-effectively? And so, so in a lot of thought right now to to have design these survey approaches, in addition, like you say, to more fishery-dependent uh, data, but um, but also entirely abandoning the, the um, surveys, uh, thinking about how we can do them more cost-effectively so they're not as expensive, not just for fisheries management, but for the for these valuations of the performance reserve system. Thanks very much. We have one more commenter. Uh, Jim Martin had emailed in, and then following that, Craig Schumann from the Department of Fish and Wildlife had, has asked to, to address the rest of the webinar as well. So, Jim? Can you hear me? Ken. Yeah, my phone has been not working very well today, so sorry. Um, so I just wanted to ask how recreational divers can help out with the surveys and increase the number of and the mm -hmm. um, frequency of them. Yes, I'll, I'll, can I respond to that? Sure. sure. So this is a great follow-up, Jim, to that last comment because, as I mentioned, uh, how we're trying to explore the cost-effectiveness of the reserve surveys. One of the big issues there is how you incorporate citizen scientists, and and it's getting the recreational sector involved in in these surveys that may be key to uh, you know making the surveys more. Uh, financially sustainable, um, and it's how you approach that. You know, how do you bring people in um, and ensure that you're collecting data that are sufficient quality to really uh, form the decision making? And so again, this is, these are issues that we're dealing with in the realm of, of generating a, a sustainable uh, MPA network monitoring program. Um, that uh, that's directly applicable, like you just suggested, to informing fisheries management as well. Stay tuned. You'll probably be asked to, to take some input on that. 
All right, thank you all very much. And, and next we have Dr. Craig Schumann of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Hi, guys. Yep. Hello. We can hear you. Outstanding. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Mark and the other members of the review team and also to OST for facilitating this review. Um, I think we got out of it. We really look forward to the final report, working with stakeholders and the Fishing Game Commission to explore how we may how we may be able to implement the recommendations to improve management of our abalone resources. You, and, and, and thank you, Craig, for the opportunity to actually um, to participate in this process. I think it's been great, and we really appreciate all the hard work you've all put into this, and also the stakeholders for tracking it so closely. I also just want to recognize staff for the work that they put in as well, just to all around, I think, a really positive effort. Yeah, to, to reiterate that as well, it's been great working with all of you. Right. With that, I think we'll draw this to a conclusion right on time. Um, for anyone who had audio problems during this, as I said at the beginning, this was recorded and will be available on the Ocean Science Trust website. And that will probably be in, in a couple of days. We'll get that there. Uh, and then, like I say, the report will hopefully be finished in early June. And again, that will be available um, on the website, and we will send that out to the, to the email list that we have for this project. So with that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark, for, for your presentation. And thanks again to the Fish, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks. Thanks, Moose. And thank you guys for calling in. It was great to hear from you again. Good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.